In this week's episode of Boat Tech TV, we look at hull speed. Over the last couple of weeks, we've covered some interesting um, basic propeller parameters. I've introduced some um, novel concepts that are out there for sailboats. And this week we're going to take it a little bit uh, further and we're going to um, complement that knowledge with um, understanding of the hull speed. Um, the chap on the screen here is William Froude and he's really the father of uh, hull speed and um, um, model correlation techniques uh, from the 1860s, 1870s. So I'm just going to touch on his work a little bit there and try and give you more of a naval architecture approach to hull speed rather than just the standard formula that everyone quotes. So, one of the first things to understand is that boats are quite unique. Um, when you have a car, they're typically two people wide and two people long. Um, so they're pretty standard and they can only go, you know, certain speeds for certain types of car. A sports car you'd expect to go faster and a sedan or a people carrier would go slower. Um, with ships, we, we're a little bit different there because we've got um, uh, long and fat and short and thin, but they can both do the 10, 12, 14 knots. Um, and the scaling laws that we're talking about here, um, for example, the hull speed, um, will give them um, some way of comparing apples for apples and oranges for oranges, as it were. Um, the fruit number, which we're going to introduce, um, although the both boats here are potentially doing the same speed, um, one is a planing craft on the left, which has a fruit number of uh, one, um, so it's in a, it's a fully planing vessel. It's not quite planing there. And the other is a sailing vessel, which would expect a fruit number of about 0.3. Uh, again, so as a naval architect, we, we, it tells us very clearly, although they're both doing 10 knots, um, for example, that they've got very, very different characteristics. And that's the whole point of um, the fruit number. There is, there is many other aspects to it, but it really does help us understand that. Um, so one of the clear things that you can see from this is that the boats are bumping into the water. They're making big bow waves. And um, this is a really important thing to understand. And this is what Froude um, was really, um, his pioneering work tackled. Um, so this is a picture of a boat there. And as you can see um, from this aerial shot, it's, it's, it's making quite an interesting wave pattern. Um, so typically on a boat, they will um, make two clear wave patterns. Um, you've got the divergent waves, which go out. And as you go, once a boat goes past you, uh, you can see them coming towards you sort of thing. And then behind the boat, as you can see on the duck there, there's transverse waves. Now, it's it's this wave system and how these waves interact um, that really is what the fruit number is all about. So what's important is that the, um, the waves, um, they increase in length as the speed increases. And there's a formula there, I don't want to scare you too much with it. Um, it's a wavelength formula, uh, but you can see the wavelength L and there's a velocity squared term in, so it's increasing with the square of the velocity. So it's getting, it's not a linear relationship, so it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger as the boat gets faster. And as it does that, it moves down and it starts to interact. And this is the, the foundations of what we're going to look at here. So hull speed, if you Google it on Wikipedia, will come up with a, a little equation here, 1.34 times the square root of L, or length on the waterline, a very important parameter. Um, and this gives you a number. And everyone thinks this is a, a scientific, physical, proven equation that's it's been around. Well, it has been around for a long time, but it isn't. It's a, it's a rule of thumb. It's something that kind of works and has been handed down and bounded around. Naval architects and engineers wouldn't use this formula. It's more of a, a general, um, like a sailboat kind of community formula. And it works very well. And I'll show you, it's, it's, it's a good approximation. Um, but the idea that I explained previously where the wavelength increases um, with the speed is, is what happens is that once you've got a crest at the bow and a crest at the stern, you have one wavelength in between, that is effectively the hull speed. Um, and that's what that equation is, is, um, is, is trying to explain. The reason um, it's called the hull speed, and again, this is... Um, it's not scientific fact, but the, the, the working theory is that the, um, the sailing ships, as you can see here, uh, HMS Bounty, 
she's pushing a bow wave there. Um, these boats didn't have engines, so they, they reached a limit. Once the, um, the, they started to make a bow wave, you need more power to push through it. They didn't have the power, so that became a limiting factor for the boats, and hence the term hull speed. So that's where that one that came from. Now, the Froude number part of it comes in um, by a chap called William Froude. And he's, he was a British chap who was active in the 1860s, 1870s. And he was working with the, with the Navy. And he developed a scaling law, um, which is still active today. And the idea that he was trying to put forward was um, when you build a car, to use the same analogy, um, you build prototypes, you can crash them, you can do tests on them, and you build, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 100, hundreds, whatever, um, cars to make your production run. When you build a ship, you build one because it's too expensive to build a prototype and then say, okay, that was okay and we'll, we'll change some things. So uh, what Froude was trying to do was he was trying to make models of ships and then scale it up to full scale. And he actually succeeded. Um, he made a, a non-dimensional quantity. Um, it's called the Froude number there. Okay, so that's the Froude number on the, uh, on the left there. Um, velocity over the square root of gravity times the load water line. Um, and the, just so I don't get anyone lost at the moment, I know it can get quite complicated here. Um, really, this is where the similarity between the hull speed ends. Um, so I've just tried to show that the hull speed is a good approximation to a, a naval architecture term. And it's, it's a very valid, it is a dimensional relationship, so you get a physical number out of it. Um, the Froude number is a non-dimensional terms, and we love our non-dimensional terms. Um, so the, the, the hull speed kind of stays where that is. You can work at your hull speed and that's it. With the Froude number, you can take it a step further insofar as we can then, because it's non-dimensional, I can run a model at a certain speed non-dimensionally, and then I can run the ship at the same speed non-dimensionally, and the data I get from the model will be valid for the ship. Then all I have to do is scale it up, and then I've used the model to get the full scale. It's how the wind tunnels work. It's, it's, it's the same idea for testing aircraft and foil sections and all that sort of stuff. Um, so that's kind of the, where the similarity ends. Um, the red line there was um, for a 26 foot sailboat we sized for a customer. And when we size it up, we like to know what the maximum engine revs are and what the hull speed is, and you can kind of move on from there. So it's, it's quite, quite interesting to, uh, to work it out. We would normally use free number something like 0 0.35, 0 0.38, 0 0.4 um, to work out the, um, the actual maximum speed the, the vessel should be traveling at based on the wave pattern it makes. Um, as you can see here, the red line is for 1.34 of actual hull speed. And... Um, on the left there, through number 0.4, and then the um, on the right, the hull speed, uh, 1.35, and they're very, very close together. So it really is a, a really good working relationship. Now then, if we move on a little bit more further, and um, we now start explaining um, what the Froude number is doing. So if you look at the equation there, um, again, what we're trying to do is to be able to scale the relationship. And the way we do that is we break it down. We decompose um, the waves into smaller things. Now, there's two really big factors that are going on when a ship goes through the water. The first one is it's got friction. Um, and the second one, as it gets to a certain point, it makes the waves. Okay, so how the method works in a nutshell is you take a model, like you'd see on the picture there, and you would tow it up and down um, a, a towing tank. It's basically a, a long, flat swimming pool. Uh, there's no waves in, in the towing tank at all, and you wait till it's dead calm. Uh, you would then tow it at different speeds, and you would build up um, a set of measurements. From the measurements, you would then um, take out one part, and this is probably going to be a hard concept to understand, but you take out the frictional resistance, how much it rubs through the water. And you can calculate that by just taking a, a plank of wood of the same surface area and dragging it down. And then the force you get from that would be the drag due to um, frictional, the frictional drag. So you would take that out. And you're left then with um, a number. And that number is called the residual resistance. Now it's made of waves. There's other things inside it. But for simplicity, that would be your waves. That's how much force you need to push through those waves for that little model. And then... To get for the ship, all you have to do is you apply a scaling method. Again, it's uh, very straightforward, and it would it would take that waves up to full scale, 
you would then scale the frictional part back up to full scale using a different method and then you'd combine the two of them together and you would have an estimate of your engine power. Froude's contribution was able to uh, non-dimensionalize the scaling to get corresponding speeds, which made it very easy to separate and then to recombine uh, in full scale. We talked about the, the laws of similarity, and just to wrap up here, so we, <laughs> I'm not going to go into any more um, crazy math. Um, the idea behind it was, like I said, if you're making cars, you can make hundreds, but if you're just doing ships, you do want to do one off. And one of the things we did at my uh, previous university, <coughs> excuse me, was we would uh, work with local companies and and just solve this exact problem. So this model here was, I don't know, three or four feet long. Uh, it was in a towing tank in uh, the university. And we were running it at corresponding speeds. Uh, like we said, we'd scaled it with the fruit number. Um, we were able to make the model and we we're measuring the post in the middle is measuring the, the force that it takes to tow it down. We separate the two components, scale them both, put them back together, and then we were able to give the shipyard an estimate of the power. When the boat goes on sea trials, um, I think this was 15 knots, um, both of them are running. Um, the model, the yellow model is running at something like two meters, uh, like six, seven feet per second. Um, the boat is running at 15 knots. So they're running at very, very different speeds, but using the fruit number, we're able to match the wave patterns to the corresponding speeds. And then we're, and you can see the wave patterns is, is very, very similar. Obviously there's scaling effects. Um, you don't get viscosity and um, various other things scaling. Um, so you, this um, the spray doesn't um, scale very well. So you tend to get uh, whisker waves, it's called. They look like bubbles coming off, off the bow and you can see them just forming there. So, and it's, it's just a very, very robust way of describing a ship. The other thing, um, what you can't see there is at the back of the boat, and this was some of the tests we did. I don't actually have the full scale versions, but this is really, it's nice and informative that you can see, obviously this is a, a, a transom, you've got twin tabs there. Um, this would have water jets in, but on a small model, you wouldn't actually put those in. As you, as you build up the speeds, you can start to see the water line <clears throat> as the velocity increases, the pressure drops and you start to get these little holes at the back and the water line is dropping, dropping, dropping. Um, the sides, the water remains the same. And you can see on the final slide here, there's a wet line just below the, um, the load water line. And from that down to the trim tabs is completely dry. And this is very typical for doing model tests and even full scale. Um, you're going to see dry transoms through number 0.35, uh, 0.4. Uh, again, it's a non-dimensional, it's not a specific speed. It's all to do with the wavelength and uh, all that good stuff that we've talked about today. Anyway, we've uh, given you a lot to talk about and a lot to consider. Um, I hope it hasn't been uh, too difficult to follow along. Um, if you have any questions on this, I'd be delighted to answer them in the comments below. Um, if you liked the video, please do subscribe. Um, we do have a um, on LinkedIn, we are on Facebook and also on YouTube. Uh, we post this on a Friday at lunchtime. Um, but my name is Dr. Rod Sampson. I'm the US agent for Brunson's Propellers here in Virginia Beach. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.